If you're not hungry now, you're going to be before we finish with you today. If you could go back in time and know that you would be transported safely back home, and if you had two hours to spend, number one, where would you go? Who would you want to talk to? And number three, what would you want to say? You have the opportunity to go back in time, and you're going to be safe. You're going to be transported and then brought right back on this soil. Who are those people that you would like to talk to? Where would you meet them, and what would you say? I asked that question to my husband this past weekend, and normally he takes some time to think things through. But immediately he said, I know exactly where I would go. I would want to go back to the year 1990 to my parents' home in Austin, Texas, and I would want to sit with them while they're still in good health, and I would want to ask them about the timelines in our family history. There's some voids there, and he can't answer the questions of the younger generation. So he would just love to go back into their home and sit with them and gain a lot of information. 120 minutes with someone that you care deeply for. What would you do? Would you ask them to forgive you? Would you just look in their eyes and stare at them because you loved them so much? Would you have a million questions for them? Well, I know exactly where I would like to go, and I'd like to take you all with me today. I want to go back to my grandmother's house, my paternal grandmother, at 103 Hinton Terrace in Charleston, West Virginia. My grandmother was just the most amazing woman, and I want to soak in all of the memories that took place at her table. Sometimes I just hunger for those days. If I could go back in time, I would pull up a chair and sit beside my grandmother, and I would hug her and use at least five of those minutes to hug her and squeeze her and just look into her eyes. And then I would say to her, how in the world did you hold our family together for so long at this old table? I'm a grandmother now too. I have 12 grandchildren and I want your wisdom I want to know how to make the table a very special place for all of them. I know exactly what she would do. She would go over to the big old buffet in her dining room, and she would get out her precious lace tablecloth. And she would shake it, and she would spread it out on the table. And then she'd walk over to her china cabinet, the one that you could only open with a key, and she would begin to pull out her favorite dishes, the Franciscan pattern, desert rose that so many of you have seen. She loved this, and she thought it was her good china. She never used it for every day. It was special, and it was for all of those special times together. She would set that table and she would smile the entire time. She would set three places, one for her, one for me, and one for Jesus, because Jesus was always invited to her table. And after it was all set, she'd go like this and say, come on into the kitchen. Let's cook together. And there we would fry up golden brown fried chicken. And then she'd mash potatoes and she'd take her spoon and she'd make a hole in the middle and she'd put some butter 
right in the top that would go down. She canned her own green beans, and they were so sweet. And she would make a great big bowl of green beans and have them ready. And then she would make another bowl of coleslaw. She made it with canned milk and sugar and mustard and mayonnaise. And oh my goodness, I can taste it all right now. But that wasn't all. She would get a big basket and fill it full with her whole made yeast rolls with butter and grape jelly. And not to say that we wouldn't have dessert, there'd always be an apple pie or a coconut cream pie. That's what my grandmother would do to get us ready for the time together. And then she'd go like this, sit down, let's fold our hands and pray. We'd have a blessing, and oh my goodness, the conversation that would take place at that table. She would smile and tell me stories, and we would eat together. And then when we were finished, she'd move the dishes out of the way and take those big old brown eyes and look at me, and she was ready to give me some wisdom. I want to share that with you today. Here's what she would say. And always keep Jesus at the table, and you be the initiator. The initiator? Yes, you don't wait for somebody to invite you to lunch. You be the person that invites somebody to lunch. And always, always keep Jesus at your table. You don't have to set a place for him. He's always there. I did that to make a point. But you always want to invite Jesus to your table. Through your food preparation and your table grace, invite Jesus to this sacred space. Sacred space? A table can be sacred space? Oh, yes, my dear. No matter where you go in the world, where Jesus is at the table, it is sacred space. If you recall your Bible history, she would say, those early Christians, they knew all about getting together at the table, even when they were a brand new movement. That is one of the things that held them together. I held your family together by calling you back to the table over and over and over, and I was the initiator. Don't you remember? I was always calling your mom and saying, come to my house for dinner. We celebrated anniversaries and birthday parties, and do you remember three of the grandkids had their rehearsal dinners right here at this old table? We had graduation lunches and most important Sunday after church lunches. I bet if this old table could talk, it would tell you all kinds of stories about our family. And she would say that with a great big smile. And then she would go ahead and she would say, let the tables wherever you sit be a place of blessing and encouragement. And then that finger would start going like this, and you always keep the young people around your table. You keep them at the table. Remember how I bragged on all four of you grandkids all the time? Well, there was a reason I did that, because I loved you, and I knew that God loved you, and I knew that no matter where you traveled in life, that you would be loved by God, and my love would go with you. We all need to be reminded about the love of Jesus, and there's no place better than at the table with delicious, delicious food. You see, 
Love will carry you through all kinds of life's difficulties. Jesus' love did that for me, she said. Remember what 1 Corinthians 13, 8 says. Love never fails. Love is great. The greatest of all is love. But sometimes she would say, life gets so tough. When you four kids were teenagers, you would come here, you were brokenhearted because somebody broke up with you. You were going through peer pressure. You were unhappy about something. And I kept calling you back to the table. It's hard to be a teenager or a young adult. We gathered here your parents and your aunts and uncles and your cousins. And I would say, don't you give up. Don't you ever give up. God has a plan for your life. Just like he has set a beautiful table. It's tailor-made for you. And then she would quote her Bible and she would say, this is what the Lord said to Jeremiah. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for welfare and not harm, to give you future and hope. Keep the young ones at your table and bless them, my dear. And then she would continue. She had lots of wisdom for me. God will take our hard times, like I talked about, and he will make them good. Just like we're never, never wasteful with food, God is never wasteful with our experiences. They all come together at some point, right with God's perfect timing. Just remember that, my dear. Any table, anywhere in the world, can be a place of blessing and hope and encouragement, and we are reminded we never give up. It can be a blessing for the initiator, like I was, or for all of the recipients. And I'd say, do you have any more wisdom for me? And she'd say, not only is this table a wonderful place of blessing and encouragement, it is a place of healing and hope. Sometimes all of us get sick physically, mentally, spiritually, and we need the table so that we can have a touch from another person or we can have a touch from the divine healer. The table is a great place for healing to begin. Do you remember that when you were young, how we gathered around this old table and we prayed? She goes, do you remember when you decided you weren't going to go to church and college? I shook my head. Well, we all gathered around this old wooden table and we prayed that you would not lose your roots. You came back, didn't you? I shook my head. And when your mom was so ill, we held hands right here in this old chair and we prayed for her. And when Grandpa died, we cried here at this table, and we remembered his life. Eyes full of tears, the tears were wiped away by these old napkins as we sat around the table and prayed for all of those people who were hurting. Healing, hope, healing, and great Power can happen at the table. That is some of the best medicine ever. Well, of course, there's just a little more because she was a woman of a lot of words. She says the table is a place of forgiveness and it's an extension of the church. When any of us hurt each other or we break God's rules or laws, the table is the place to sit with the person. 
And she goes, don't you be afraid to invite the one that has hurt you to sit at your table. When you've been wronged or somebody has been wronged, the table is a great place to make it right. Sometimes you sit down one way, but when you stand up, you're a different, different person. Feed the people at your table that have hurt you and sit with them and work it out. And if you have broken God's laws, invite Jesus. Get your Bible out and invite Jesus to sit right here. And you open up that Bible, you look him in the eyes, and you ask for forgiveness. Your Bible says this, my dear, bear with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you. You must forgive. And when you gather with friends over the meal, go ahead and talk about the future of your church. Pray for your pastors. Pray for your leaders. Talk about your Bible studies. Ask questions. Laugh and be happy. And then the finger went out again. Don't you ever go to a table and gossip about somebody. If the intent is to go out and cut someone down or say something bad about somebody, it'll become like yeast. It'll double in size. The Lord just may need to move to another table, a table where there is lots of love. And then finally, she would close with this. She would say, remember, what happens at the table is embedded in your mind and heart for the rest of your life. You will be able to carry that with you no matter where you go. So my dear, as you go back, May Jesus always sit at your tables, and may you always be filled with joy. Now, there's more. We've talked a lot about table fellowship, but there's actually more, and I want to go ahead and read the very beginning of our scripture, because when this was put together, we only talked about table fellowship. But there's so much more. And if you have your Bibles, look at Acts 2, beginning with verses um, 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of the bread and prayers. Awe came up on everyone because many signs and wonders were done by the apostles. All who believed were together, and they had all things in common. And they would sell their possessions and goods, and they would distribute the proceeds to all as many as had need. Did you know that I just read nine characteristics of the early church. William Barclay would say this, in this passage we have a lightning summary of the characteristics of the early church. I'm going to, in case you didn't find them, I'm going to mention, it was a learning church. The apostles taught and they learned. Are you learning? Are you going to small groups and Bible studies, and are you learning? We've already talked about table fellowship, but it was a praying church. Listen to this. They always went to God before they went out into the world. They were able to meet their problems of life because they had first met Him. It was a reverent church. It was holy, and it was honored. Is this a reverent church to you? It was a church where things happened. 
It was a church where things happened. He says, if we expect great things from God and attempt great things from God, then things happen. More things could happen if we believe that with God and us working together, we could make them happen. Do you think signs and wonders have gone away? I don't think so when we all work together to make them happen. It was a sharing church. If somebody was in need, they shared and they even sold things so that they could help one another. It was a worshiping church. They came to God's house every week. How's your attendance? Do you come to God's house or go someplace to a house of prayer each week? It was a happy church. It was welcoming, and it was not gloomy. One day outside, there was a man standing across the street, and he was looking at the church. And somebody said, come on in today. And he goes, that's an old church. I don't want to go in an old church. I imagine there's not a lot going on. Well, that was the day we had the jazz band, and we were doing jazz service and jazz communion. He couldn't believe it. He walked in and he goes, oh my goodness, this old place is alive and well. And finally, it was a church where everybody seemed to like the people. They loved him because they knew they had Jesus in their lives. But out of all of those, and there are nine, table fellowship is one of the most important. And if you think about it, the, the nine characteristics are like the spokes of a bicycle wheel. They radiate out. The hub in the center is Jesus. These nine characteristics move out and they keep the rim of the wheel strong so that no matter what happens, that wheel is tough and it won't get off balance. And you know what? That rim kept the church moving down through the ages. And yes, it did hit some bumps. It will continue to hit some bumps, but it has been rolling like crazy. And right this moment, as I'm talking and you're listening, it is still rolling. So the early Christians got it right. They practiced when there were only 2,000 of them. They practice these nine things. And as you go out this month during our foodie um, time together to fellowship over a table, you may want to ask yourself these questions. Are we a strong church like the early church? Or where are we weak? Where do we need to jump in and help fix things? And as you go out, Invite people that you don't know or you barely know to have lunch or coffee with you because it says, and day by day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Did you know another table has been prepared for you today? This is the Lord's table, and our communion stewards came in here at 7 a.m., to get everything ready for you. Maybe sometime you would like to be a communion steward. Maybe today, with your little cards, is the day that you might invite somebody to come so they could not only share great table fellowship with you at lunch, but they could share in the Lord's table. So we are ready right now. The meal is ready. And Jesus asks us to do this as often as we can. Would you pray with me? Dear God, we thank you so much for the early Christians, our brothers and sisters in the faith, that knew the importance of table fellowship, 
and knew the importance of those wonderful nine characteristics. Help us to be today a church that is strong, a church that is rolling into the future. And we thank you so much for the table that has been prepared for us today. We love you, Lord. Let us roll with you down through the ages. It's in your name we pray. Amen.